At its very core, drug science must remain independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. It's with the support of the drug science community we're able to do this and make the podcast in the first place. If you're able to become a drug science community member and support the show, you too will be supporting the dissemination of evidence-based drug policies. Without you, none of this would be possible. For anybody interested, there's a link in the show notes. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Here we're bringing together experts and activists for a rational, honest and informed conversation about drugs. Well, good evening and welcome to this podcast, another of the Drug Science Podcast. And today I'm very pleased to say that I have with me an ex-Special Forces, British Special Forces soldier called Ollie Ollerton, who you have may well have seen on the television in his Channel 4 series, uh, Who Dares Wins. But he's here today to talk not just about his past, but also about the present and the future plans he has through the charity he's helped set up called Heroic Hearts. So welcome, Ollie. Hello, Dave. Thank you for having me on today. I'm really excited. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward because I think we've got a lot to talk about. So why don't, why don't we start at the beginning? It's always good to go back to when you were, before you were famous, before you were even in, you know, tell me about your past and how you got into the, the life you got into. Christ, uh, how long have we got? Because that's, that's the... <laughs> why did you join the army? No, that's no, a good no, place no. to start. I'll sort of, because it's all very important to give a bit of a roadmap, actually. So, mm. and also sort of anyone that has read my books will understand that life for me really began 10 years old. And I say that because a traumatic incident that would, would then go on to last a lifetime uh, happened when I was 10 years old. And that really, for me, I can't remember a lot before 10 years, from 10 years of age. And I was, I was in a very traumatic incident where I got attacked at the circus in, believe it or not, Burton-on-Trent, not somewhere exotic, but Burton-on-Trent in Staffordshire. I got attacked at the circus by a chimpanzee that nearly went me to bits. So that was really sort of a line drawn in the sand of where, where my sort of troubles started, so to speak. And I had a troublesome, after I survived that, I had a very, let's say, uh, turbulent upbringing as a kid i got into a lot of trouble with with the police and i was on a path of self-destruction so when at 14 i decided i wanted to join the military i think that was sort of, that was music not only to my mum's ears but to those that sort of doubted that i would i would never see the inside of a cell and for me you know it was that sort of directive 14 years old i made a very conscious and very direct decision that the military was the the place for me you know and it was because i was chasing danger so much it seemed like the answer it seemed like the answer mm. that you know a war zone would be everything i could ever wish for many people join the army because uh, it gives them the family they don't have but for you it was yeah. more about adventure yeah, I mean, for me, it was, I mean, it did give me that. It was that. And that, I think a lot of people as well joining the military, and I know a lot of people joining the military, um, a lot of people are running from something, you know, and, and really it, it was. You know, I mean, my father left home when I was 13, and it was. It was It was a brotherhood, a family, a club, and that was a massive attraction. It was also the fact my father was a, a captain in the, uh, in the army, and we oh, had right. a bit, yeah, we had some military history. So it seemed like a natural thing for me to do. So 14 years old, I made that decision. And from then on in, I really kind of lost all interest in school because I was like, I, I just wanted to join the military. I, I, didn't, I didn't see the, the attraction of sort of academia. And that, and that was it. So anyway, I managed to achieve my dreams when I was 18 years old, joined the military, uh, the Royal Marine Commandos, and uh, 32 weeks of horrendous training. And then I finally passed, got my Green Beret, and then went off to war. And that was a big wake-up call because it was like you know when you first get exposed to war it's very different than the, than the brochure and also yes. what, nothing anyone tells you can prepare you for that so it was a massive wake-up call for me going to northern ireland and actually being on the front end i then came back from there went to operation desert storm and then i came back and to be quite honest i lost my passion i think i wanted more of it and there wasn't enough of it so that's mm. that's what really you know at that crossroads i said look i want to join either be a civilian or join the special forces and at that point i just thought nah, those special forces types there they're created on another planet somewhere and yeah. uh, you know and it was just a world that was too sort of far out of my grasp 
Well, that's what I told myself. And then it was an officer from when I served in Iraq that I bumped into who just said, look, you must do it. He said, I think you've got what it takes. And if you don't do it, you'll regret it for the rest of your life. And that really did play on my mind. I thought, yeah, it gave me that gave me the confidence, courage to give it a go. And, you know, I was one out of 260 thereabouts who actually passed, you know, passed the, the grueling selection process, SAS selection process. Oh. Six months later, I was one of Tougher than getting into the England soccer team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Or oh, it's tougher than getting into a pub these days. <laughs> So, yeah, it's, you know, I was, I was extremely proud to actually pass that selection. But again, you know, I got there. And, and the reason I'm saying this stuff as well, because this links in, you know, I got to the special forces. And once I got there, I just, I wasn't happy. I wasn't settled. I wasn't fulfilled. This perception and the reality was so far removed, so far removed. It was, you know, and that was disappointing for me. And then, you know, I would find that, and then I left the special forces 2000, Said I'd never do anything military again. I wanted to carve my own path. I ended up back in, in a war zone in Iraq for six years. Probably the most traumatic and horrendous experience in my life when it comes to my mental health. And I really started to suffer. You know, I was heavily abusing alcohol, Valium. So, but wait a second. You went back to Iraq, what, as a private contractor? Yeah, correct. I went back as a contractor. You know, I said I'd never go back. But then I earned more in one month as a contractor than I did in one year in the military. You know, so I call it fool's gold now, Dave, yeah. because it's like, you know, you go there because it's the money, and it's just the money, but then you, you realise why you get paid that money. And then finally, that spat me out of the back end around about 2006, 2007. Again, said I wasn't going to do anything military-wise. And I was living in Australia at that time. I'd moved to Australia. And then something caught my attention, and that was kids being sold into slavery and prostitution over in Southeast Asia by their families, which was a, something I just could not comprehend. So I used my money from Iraq to fund operations in Southeast Asia, rescuing kids from the cartels. I had a four-man team. We did more than the Thai government had ever done in rescuing these kids. And then there was a backlash. The US State Department got into the Thai government it was in the newspapers all over the world and the Thai government denied all such knowledge of anything that happened in their country like that. And then there was a manhunt. We had to escape out of Thailand over, over the Burmese border back to Australia at that time. And then that's when the boiling pot, I call it that because it's, you know, it's of my, men, you know, my, my, I, it's exploded. My mental health, you know, was, it was bad. It was bad at that stage and it was like a pressure cooker. So do you think, your all this activity was about avoiding confronting the boy. The, the boy. You were keeping the lid on the pot by distracting yourself by doing other things. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. You know, one thing I learned about this, and I only, I only dealt. You know, I'm sure we'll get onto that, but I only dealt with the with the chimp incident a year ago, and up until that point, I think that's that's spot on. That Dave, you know, I was, you know, denying what was going on, trying, trying to find all the, you know, I was bouncing all over the world thinking these, I think I, I couldn't, you know, although I was doing this stuff, I could not find something that I could not feel balanced, settled or anything. And yeah. I was bouncing yeah. one thing to the next, but I tell you now, actually doing the operations in Southeast Asia, that was the first time I found something that really made me feel, it, it was the most humbling thing I've ever done, you know, to see those kids. And, and that's, that's really for me, it late, although it was, horrendous how it fell apart it was the first i then understood the power of helping other people and that was phenomenal that mm -hmm. was that was something i took away from that but the fact that it fell apart overnight was devastating for me because i just thought mm -hmm. i've now found it this is going to be me i'm going to do this for the rest of my days and i, I was so happy and then all of a sudden it fell apart did you get back to australia yeah and and it was at that point i started and to have some suicidal thoughts and stuff and i don't know if i'd have ever done anything you know gone that far but the fact you're having that level of thoughts is is a concern so that was the turning point for me i knew i needed to make some serious changes so you escape from thailand across the border into burma myanmar and then you you get back to australia and then you start to kind of reevaluate what you're about is that right yeah, no, it was, it was at that point, you know, I was starting to, again, heavily abuse myself, you know, self-medicating and drink, drugs, all kinds of stuff. And it was this, it was this path of self-destruction. This, and, and then it was, it was really looking back and I just thought I was caught in this repeat habit loop of uh, negative habits. 
And in my early 40s, and I started to think my life is going nowhere. It's, you know, and I just thought that, you know, having suicidal thoughts and stuff like that, and which, you know, I just knew I needed to turn my life around. Uh, and it's at that point, I got a little bit of a stability over in Australia. I got a decent job. And then for a couple of years, I held it down and things were going better. You know, I was starting to really start to claw my way out of this bottomless pit of despair and depression. And then 2014 came back to the UK uh, with with the dream of setting up my own company, Breakpoint. And, you know, first thing I did when I came back, you know, I thought I had these dreams of, you know, this really uh, optimistic dream of setting up this company to help other people. But I knew I needed to make some changes to myself first. So I came back to the UK 2014. I actually put myself into self-isolation, believe it or not, for three months. And through that three months, I really started to get rid of those, look at those negative things that were no longer serving me, you know, the drink, the drugs, all that kind of stuff. And at that point, it wasn't about stopping. It was trying to sort of reduce my intake. And that was really the road to, you know, that's where I started to carve a new path and of, of positivity. And in that house, shortly after that, I then got approached to go on the TV show, SAS Who Dares Wins. You know, I never set out to be an actor, never set out to be a celebrity, but it was an opportunity for me to get on TV and really uh, get some exposure for my business. And that was really the start. Now we're sort of in the back end of, we've done six years of that, six, seven years of, of the show, been all over the world with it, just started doing an, an SAS Australia version. I've written three books and life has, has just been absolutely amazing. So you were quite fortunate then that the uh, Channel 4 hunted you down, did you? I mean, that was the, the real break for you. Yeah, no, it was, it was amazing. It was almost like a gift from the gods. I mean, I put myself into that house, that isolation. I had nothing really. I, all I had to go on was, you know, sort of visualization, goal setting, all that sort of stuff that really for me, it was, it was when I started to invest in myself, the return on investment was massive and there was loads of things, but really one, you know, when the show saw sort of, the opportunity there for the show, I was just, I, I sort of laughed at myself and went, wow, it was almost like a gift from the gods at that time. You know, I was, I was dreaming about how we could get exposure for the business and everything. And that just landed on my lap. It was unbelievable. And how have uh, other veterans received or how do they appreciate, how do they re relate to you now you're, uh, you're famous and they're not? <laughs> yeah, I mean, listen, the, the feedback in general has been really positive. I mean, it's we're such a, you know, the show has, has been amazing. It's given us a real voice. And I feel we've got a duty of care to really inspire people. And it's doing exactly that. You know, you will always get people that are jealous and they, you know, they, they don't approve. But that really comes down to jealousy. That's all that's more to do with them than it is to do with us. But uh, in general, it's been accepted widely and it's been phenomenal. I mean, the show doesn't, you know, there's we have to go through some strict sort of vetting before any of the shows or anything we do publicly to make sure that we do not disclose. And we, we all signed disclosure agreements, you know, so we've got to keep that kind of stuff it has to be vetted and we don't sell secrets or anything like that. So there's no such thing on the TV show. Right. right. But you also with several charities, don't you? You've working with Heroic Hearts and you also, I think, have an interest in brain injury. So can you tell us about this? Yeah. I mean, I've, listen, I, I am a great supporter of charities. I mean, initially I have obviously a fondness to support military charities, but it's not just um, aimed yeah. solely at military, you know, it's people in general. I mean, everything we do as a company, my company Breakpoint, and I've got a couple of other companies as well. Everything is aimed at helping other people, just really not just people that have gone through a traumatic event, but people that are just don't really understand their full potential and are living in a state of depression. But I definitely, you know, the Heroic mm. Hearts Project has been amazing. It was, it, I bumped into those guys on social media. And first of all, it was mm -hmm. the parts in the US. And at that time, I was starting to investigate the benefits of psychedelic drugs for treatment of PTSD. So as I started looking, all of a sudden I bumped into, as like I say on social media, I bumped into Heroic Hearts Project in the US. Yeah. And I ended up meeting up with one of the organizers or, or the guy that runs it called Jesse. I met up with Jesse in London. He was over here for a, a visit and um, he invited me to go to an ayahuasca retreat in Costa Rica. And this was in the back end of 2019. 
And that was a phenomenal right. experience. I got the opportunity to actually join a load of veterans from all over the world. And all a lot of these guys, you know, suffering with quite bad, you know, very some with very bad PTSD. But that was a phenomenal experience. And really, like I said, I'd never dealt with my trauma until that moment. Oh, I see. So for you, the PTSD wasn't from the military. It was from the circus attack. Well, the thing is, listen, I can't, I think a lot of the times everyone's looking for a reason and a cause. And I think mm -hmm. the longer you have to try and pinpoint the specific event, the specific traumatic event, I think the more you do that, the more you're living with the problem, in the problem, you're just recirculating the problem. And really for me, That's I true. know that childhood trauma is is one of the worst because we're absolutely you know when it comes to learning all that kind of stuff we are absolute sponges at that young age aren't we and anyone that goes yeah. through childhood trauma you know one thing i learned from that experience is the fact that when we go through a traumatic event i think it's i feel it's a self-preservation system that we immediately lock away the the really emotional trauma and that's almost like a self-protection mm system for us to get through the short term and that's really how i see that yeah. event affecting me as a, as a child it was never dealt with you know what i mean it was immediately you know my self preservation system my survival system whatever you want to call it it locked away that intimate trauma but it doesn't mean that you can lock it away and forget it it still needs to be dealt with and i never dealt with that and that it, and hindsight's a wonderful thing it never won any wars but it's great to reflect that I then saw how that traumatic event had really affected, changed the journey of my life and how it was really pushing me into some very unfavorable situations and really giving me an unhealthy balance for life. Because was, of the seeking adventure and, and the seeking of distraction. Yeah, but it's more, I was, I was almost chasing death, Dave. I saw it as that. It was almost chasing yeah, the yeah. extreme circumstances. Mm. And I had this unhealthy appetite for war. And it was almost like, you know, even when I went to Iraq as a contractor, I mean, I just didn't, I was living day by day because I didn't have any, I really sort of didn't think I'd live past the next day. And I was living every day like it was its last. Yeah. And I was on, on this path of real self-destruction. And that I see as starting off with the chimp. I'm not saying, look, the military did have, I believe, some effect, but mm. I think it just, it just went into the pressure cooker of, of issues. And then when coming out the back end of the military, the whole transition into military, into civilian life, you know, they train special forces soldiers to actually be, to operate in chaos. And, you know, that's when you actually get mm. low, you know, the normal everyday living is not something, it, it's harder to deal with that than it is chaos. So when you come out the back end of the military, you know, you're, you find yourself in a very unfamiliar world. And that transition is horrendous for, for people that, you know, not for everyone, not for everyone, but for, for some, it's horrendous. And certainly for me. What proportion of people coming out of special forces would, would be like you would actually find that the real world is the normal world is actually more difficult to live in? Well, I wouldn't just, let's not, let's not just say the special forces. Let's say the military in general. I think I'd say a massive percentage. I mean, yep. okay. I think, you know, and, and at the end of the day, it's, I think everyone goes through it, but it depends on the, you know, the, the duration of how long they go through that differs. I think that's the difference because yeah, everyone comes I out. Yeah. yeah. So for me, I mean, it was a 10 year old, 10 year journey, but I, I believe that everyone will go, goes through that experience of just that transition to life. And I think you, you know, you really have to have a well laid out plan when you leave the military a really well laid out plan and if you don't and i didn't particularly i just thought you know i've been the top of my game in the military i'll just do exactly the same in civilian street and it it doesn't work like that you know it really doesn't work like that so for me the journey went on and on and i was subduing the reality of who i was or the reality of my situation with um substance abuse hi it's david nutt here again i want to take a moment to thank all of the drug science community members in a world of paid sponsorships political and commercial interference, drug science is and always will be independent. If you value the show as an educational resource and want to help keep us going, you can do so at drugscience.org.uk. Without our community, the dissemination of unbiased information would not be possible. By becoming a drug science community member, you help to create a world where drug control is rational and evidence-based, where drug use is better informed and drug users are understood, where drugs are used to heal 
not harm. Furthermore, by becoming a premium community member, you will receive a signed copy of my autobiography, access to exclusive events. At the end of the season, we will be hosting an exclusive Q&A podcast episode with all of our premium community members, where you can ask me anything. You can find out how to do this in the show notes. So now, thank you, and back to the show. And I'm interested, your father being in the military, have you ever spoken with him about it? Did he have similar problems, or is he sympathetic to you? No, my father wasn't. My, my grandfather was in the military, but he died when I was, when I was quite young. Oh, right. but, yeah. Your grandfather was the captain? Yes, correct. I never spoke to him about the military, never talked about the military, and I just don't think it was one of those things as a young boy that, I, you know, and also the, the fact that my grandfather wasn't, you know, just didn't sit there and open up about it. That's one thing that has changed in the military now. People are much more comfortable and interested in sharing, aren't they? Because uh, previously it was all about just, as you say, say nothing for the rest of your life and not, not distress yeah. other people. But at least now people in the military are beginning to talk more about the negativity of it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's such a great thing. I think and, and in general, you know, the, the, this alpha male stigma, which is, you know, I look back now and I, you know, when I look back at the military, as soon as you, you showed any kind of emotion or that was considered weakness. And then it was the remedy for mm. that week was to get absolutely shit faced on alcohol and go on a few yes. days, you know, and that, that was the solution. So, but and now that's changed, you know, there's decompression and all kinds of stuff and all kinds of uh, platforms for you to get help. So, but the thing is, if the one thing about it is I, I often, people often ask me, you know, was the help for you? And it's not, you know, I don't resent the fact there wasn't because I know even if there was, I wasn't in a mindset to be able to, to accept that, mm. you know, ready. And, and I also think as well, you know, that, you know, you can't choose when that sort of trauma comes out. You know, at that time of me leaving, I'd have said, if anyone said you've got issues, I'd have, I'd have told them to, to, you know, all kinds of profanity. Yeah. You know, it, it's, you've got to be ready to accept it. But you, you got insight, then you worked on your insights and you worked on your behavioural change. Was there a sort of moment when you got that insight? Well, for me, it was, you know, it was, it was that turning point when I came back from Southeast Asia, landed in Australia, yeah. and then I just understood that, you know, it's really, it, it was a point where I, I looked and I was bouncing all over the world looking for this external fix that was going to make me happy. And then it was a realization that happiness is not out there. It starts within, you know, you've got to be happy on the inside before your external world is yeah. a reflection of that. You know, but the thing is, you you, you find happiness in in going out, you know, having a few drinks and taking drugs or whatever it is. And really, you know, that those things are a short-term fix. They're not giving you any longevity. And really, they do the opposite at the end of the day. And that was a realization for me in 2011 when I came back and realized that I really start, needed to start investing in myself. And once I did start investing in myself, I noticed the return on investment straight away. You know, you can notice the difference straight away. But then you, did you seek out this uh, ayahuasca therapy or, or was it someone suggested it to you? How, how did you find out about it? Yeah, that's, in, that's an interesting question, Dave, because I actually, fortunately for me, which saved me an absolute fortune, and the reason I went to Australia is because I had an Australian girlfriend that was a psychologist. Now, the reason I say that is because it was, I mean, we, we separated while I was still living in Australia, but we, we kept in touch. And then she started to do some work with veterans and psychedelics. And she had been pushing me to give it a go and said how much it would benefit me. So she's the one that sort of steered me towards it. And then I started to, you know, do some research into it. And I'm a great believer that once you put it out there, you know, once you create a desire, a visualization of what you want to happen, it, well, it certainly does for me anyway, these days, it, it just comes into your field of view. And it did for me, you know, me bumping into, into Jesse from Instagram, it was almost like it was, it was scheduled to happen, you know, just because I'd started thinking yeah. about it. Yeah, and I, I'm particularly interested in, and I, I've seen the film, I'm shocked and all, and I think Jesse's in it, and it's yeah. interesting for me as a, as a, you know, a standard NHS uh, psychiatrist, uh, you know, we, most of what I do is talking to individual people, and all the treatments we've done in, in our clinic in terms of psychedelic therapy research has always been, you know, basically one-to-one, -one, whereas I'm interested in this fact that the military, getting groups of people with similar backgrounds, soldiers together, it seems to be a very powerful way of actually administering this kind of therapy and also it might even be better than having just think solitary sessions I mean, do you have any thoughts on that 
Oh, I have loads of thoughts on that, Dave. Absolutely uh, support that theory 100%. When I went to, you know, that's from experience. I, I'd sat there with veterans from all over the world in Costa Rica, a place called Soltara, which is an amazing place. And, you know, I spent mm. nine days with them and, you know, hearing some of their stories and hearing some of their stories, you know, they these guys had been through the ringer. They'd all had their separate journeys. And then once we started doing the treatments, we had, a, I think we had four separate treatments. And after we sat there and at, at the end of that, um, those four, four ceremonies, the comments from us all was the fact that, you know, it was almost like having two years of standard therapy in one session. You know, it was just phenomenal, the, the kind of breakthroughs. And certainly for me as well, you know, mm. I speak from experience of myself there. I mean, I didn't go there thinking I need to deal with this, the chimp, you know. Right. I went there, took, took the medicine, and then did the went through the ceremony. It doesn't go to where you uh, want it; it goes to where you need it. And for me, uh, you know, yeah, this goes back to what, I, what I said to you before about people are always trying to pinpoint, you know, find the trauma, put a label on it, trying to actually say, you know, this was the event. You don't know, you know, and, and you can't pinpoint it. And that's the beauty of the medicine because it finds it for you, with it, without you having to force it. Yeah. Yes. Well, of course, many people from with your kind of experiences, they their brain has become very efficient at suppressing the memory. Yeah. Yeah. But I think in this, you know, in our societies as well, I just I just feel that there's a lot of potential we have that's been suppressed for hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years. You know, I just know that these psychedelics are really unleashing the full potential of us being able to not only see you know, being able to map out our future, but also unravel the past. Yes, I mean, reflecting on this interesting, there's a sort of parallel in my mind between war and psychedelics in the sense that, I don't know what you think, but certainly a lot of what you did in war was politically driven and it probably didn't do a lot of good. And, and no. a lot of what happened with psychedelics was politically driven and actually did a lot of harm because the banning of psychedelics was, was a political decision. It wasn't a, yeah. in any sense a medical or a, a health one. Yeah. A lot yeah. of people have been denied. No, I, I just, you probably won't want to put this in, but I just, I just believe that once the pharmaceutical companies got involved and there was, there was money to be made, I think to me, it's almost like they're more, more or less maintaining disease because it's a business as opposed to resolving it. Yeah, the, the pharmaceuticals has been a very big business. I mean, it, yeah, it's, it has its good points. I mean, it, yeah. it has, uh, they have got the infrastructure, at least, you know, hopefully we'll have a, the COVID vaccine will work. But they've also, the industry has also been hamstrung by the illegal status of these drugs we want to work with. And yeah, and it basically, many shareholders in big companies won't allow them to invest in something that's illegal. Because you know, I mean, I've seen this in other areas of medicine as well. You know, once things are illegal, companies, investors are scared away, and that means that nothing happens. And this this fifty years since these drugs were really banned, it's, it's been a horrific denial of, mm. uh, of of what could be hugely important therapies. So, how are we going to change this? Are you? I mean, are you helping us in the campaign? Yeah, I, w I want to do whatever I can to help because at the end of the day, I mean. I feel that again, like I said before, Dave, you know, we've got a duty of care to really, to help other people. And, and for me, it's about if there's, and I said this when I came back from Costa Rica, you know, if there is alternative therapies that are having groundbreaking results, then people need to know about it. People need to know that there's other options and some people just won't accept it because the thing, you know, just as you talked about there before that, you know, the reputation that once you mention the word drugs, due to the mm. sort of, you know, mainstream media, due to the misinformation and, and people aren't prepared to educate themselves on, on the history and the, you know, the, the origin of, of such drugs, you know, they've been abused and, you know, people come up with, you know, straight away, they come up with an opinion just on that word alone, but really mm. you know, people need to understand that, you know, these, these drugs have, have got a real, have got massive potential to really help people that are suffering so it needs to be, the word needs to be spread and one of the reasons i'm very keen to do interviews with ex-military people like you is because no one can argue you haven't done your bit for society you know you, you it may not have been very helpful but you did what you thought was would be useful you've committed you put your life on the line many times and now yeah. if anyone deserves help you know you and your colleagues uh, ex-military colleagues do and, that, and i think you're in a somewhat privileged position in terms of the, the media then 
and people like me who they just think I'm some kind of you know airy headed academic, but you're <laughs> you're really grounded in the realities of the world. Yeah, so we do. You know, I think if anyone deserves it, it's people like you. But then on top of that, you've got this other problem, which we haven't actually discussed on this program before. So I'm going to take you through that now, which is this traumatic brain injury. And I presume we're looking at the, in your terms, it's about explosive devices and shock injuries. Is that mm. something that, you know, you're working on? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's something that, that we sort of have, but that's not just for people in the military as well. You know, that's people boxing, that's, you know, people in rugby, all that kind of stuff. Mm. So, you know, you've got to look as well, when you look at soldiers, regardless of, one thing about mental health, people think that there has to be a checklist. People think that you have to have gone to war, done this, done that. And and people are always looking for that comparison to be able to qualify if they've got mental health. And mental health issues are really relative just to the person. So really, I mean, when you look at soldiers, I mean, there's a lot of study and research about that just wearing a helmet and firing a weapon, that can cause brain injury. So what the vibrations, the vibration, because they, because you wear a ballistic helmet, then firing a weapon so close to your head, the shot goes into the helmet. Yeah. And, you know, it, it can't escape from the helmet. So it goes into your head. It's sort of your brain oh. absorbs it before the helmet ex- sort yeah. of allows it to go out. So just simply by fire, you know, you don't even have, you, you just have to go to a firing range and training and you've, you've already started that journey of, of brain injury. So it is very interesting, but it's a very interesting topic, and, and certainly I think there's a lot of uh, research that needs to be done on how, that, how you can really uh, help people with brain injury. Is that being studied in the military now? I don't know if they're doing it in the military. I don't have a close – I don't really have a lot to do with the military, to be quite honest, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I would say I don't think so, because as soon as they start to identify that they're the cause of a problem, there's, they're open to all kinds of lawsuits, aren't they? Uh, well, potentially, I suppose. But, I mean, on the other hand, you know, if it's – People, you know, if you could, there may be ways you can mitigate against that, that kind of, at least that self-inflicted uh, head injury. Obviously, you can't do much about uh, explosive devices, you know, putting shock, you know, explosive shock waves through you. But it may be possible to alter the weapons design to, to minimize that, I think. How are you receiving that? Can you have a dialogue with, uh, with current, basically, decision makers in the military? Are you allowed to in? Are you allowed into that, that room? Well, I haven't been so far. I mean, I've, I've still got to, you know, to be quite honest, my, my days with, you know, getting involved with Heroic Hearts, you know, is taking a step back because once we started to look at getting the, getting the organisation up and going, you know, COVID hit last year. So we have had it, we took a lot, we took some amazing steps and leaps forward. And then all of a sudden, because of the situation, it's not really allowed us to push it, push forward with um, with what we need to achieve and the people we need to meet. So to be honest, there's not a lot been done from my point of view um, to this point, but I'm certainly hoping moving forward that we can have those conversations and that I will be, you know, due to my background, due to the, pe- the person that my sort of heritage in the military, that I'll be able to get those conversations. No, because I imagine that lockdowns must be particularly difficult for people who used to be very active and uh, like you were, I mean, and uh, also engaged with other. You know, I mean, your your business presumably has slowed down as well, has it? Yeah, I mean, I've got three. I've got sort of three businesses. I've got a so when where one door. Fortunately for me, one of them's a fitness app. So that's I mean that that's doing okay but it's online but you know we had a front-facing business which was corporate training management and that's taken a bit of a back seat this year or not a bit it has taken a back seat so we had to delay everything till this year we'll see how that goes and then i'm doing loads of a lot of corporate virtual talks so we've turned the classroom at the office into a studio and i do virtual talks and, and really you know everything i do with corporates is all about people under, understanding their true potential I'm really uh, helping them them to see through the fog and not get bogged down in this state of fear that everyone's being uh, put under. Yeah, so you see that there's a sort of the lessons to be learned from being at the extreme end of fear and under fire. You can relate to the, the normal world then, which is, as you say, I guess, understanding the balance between your potential and the uh, and your sort of predictions. Is it, would that be right? Yeah, I mean, for me, a, a big thing, Dave, you know, it, uh, uh, there's a lot of people out there that are claiming that I do have, you know, I'm not saying they don't have problems, but a lot of, a lot of people have got issues. And, you know, a lot of them are, think that alcohol is the answer, you know, alcohol and other, other kind of substances. But, you know, people have got to really 
you know, if they want help, they've really got to meet halfway and, and get rid of these external things that are, are really not allowing the people that are trying to help get to the raw nerve of the issue. Mm. So for me, that was a massive yeah, thing. Yeah, and as soon as I took drink out the equation and everything else, the clarity allowed me to really understand what the issue was, you know, or, or start to do things that really were more positively geared to my mental health. Yes. I mean, people, I think, underestimate the negative impact that alcohol has on mental health. People think about alcohol as being a problem because you get drunk and mm. they think of the problem in terms of, say, cirrhosis or or high blood pressure, but they don't realize it it's, can be deleterious and damaging to anyone who's got mental health problems. It's sort of blinkering your eyes, you know, you, you get a yeah. transient numbing, but almost it always, when the alcohol washes out of your system, you're left in a worse place. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. And that, that for me is where I kept, that's what created the binge drinking because I didn't, you know, facing that reality and going through that sort of cold turkey was, I couldn't stand that. It exactly as you said there, David, it numbs you so you don't hit, you know, you, it quiets your mind down and it numbs you. But then when you return, the beast comes back with sharper teeth the next day. And that's when, you know, you reach back. Mm. For me, definitely, it's, you know, I was like, the simplest thing to do was reach for another drink and, and carry on. So, and then that would end up a few day binges, which would take me days to recover from. And it was, it was hideous. It was a hideous routine. Well, I am impressed that you've broken free from it and you've done it all by yourself but i suppose that's the nature of you isn't it Holly? you've uh, you've made your own path from a very early age and uh, yeah. uh congratulations on uh, coming out well at the end i mean as you say three companies not many people manage that no no and, and, and you know at the end of the day it's not about bragging that i've got three companies it's the fact that, that for me regardless of how the businesses are doing it's really the fact for me that from where i've come from to where i am happiness wise that's the real success for me so i wouldn't advise people to do the same and i don't in my books and in my talks i don't advise people to to follow my path because you know i look back and think that i could have made life easier for myself i could have i did the stereotypical male thing alpha male thing of not talking and putting on a brave face a smile here and there and and, and there, it was a lie it was a it's a massive lie and I wouldn't talk to people. I didn't want to show that weakness. But now looking back, I realized the, weak, the weakness was actually not being able to talk. That's a very, very good statement to which to finish. So thank you so much, Ollie Ollerton, for doing this podcast with me. And I, I wish you all the best in the future. And uh, hopefully our paths will cross post-COVID. Thank you very much. I hope so, Dave. Thank you very much for having me on the show. It's been a pleasure. Well, that's the end of this episode of the Drug Science Podcast. Thank you for listening. But before you go, I would just like to share with you a question from our Drug Science community members. Recently, we recorded a very special podcast episode in which we invited all of our premium and philanthropic community members to ask me anything they like. Their questions were so good, I thought we should include one or two of them at the end of every podcast episode. So please enjoy this new segment of the show. Apologies for the audio quality as we recorded the session over Zoom. Hopefully they're vaguely relevant to what we've been discussing. And if you want to ask me anything, perhaps we could do an Ask David Anything Part 2. Enjoy. Greetings from Texas. Question. I've really been fascinated following what they're calling the psychedelic renaissance. Obviously, yeah. the research that's you know went on in the 50s and 60s is now going on again. Thank you very much, obviously, for your contribution. It's fascinating to me, you mentioned MindMed earlier. We're seeing a lot of these corporadelic or whatever you'd like to call yeah. them, people trying to get into the space, who are talking about, you know, they're, they're recognizing your research, Carhart Harris, all the people that are doing this great research showing treatment-resistant depression, uh, eating disorders, OCD, anxiety disorders, end-of-life issues, all these effects of psychedelics, very effective. And then they start talking about, well, now our goal is to find a way to use these molecules for their benefit, but without a trip. In other words, how can we modify mm -hmm. LSD or psilocybin or, mm -hmm. I don't know, 2CB or whatever, in, in some way so that, oh boy, we're going to get all these really great benefits, but you're not going to experience subjectively anything. And... I was just wondering, since, I mean, obviously this is your area of research, do you even see that as possible? I mean, how much of the effect, you know, what effect is molecular 
Mm-hmm. What effect is molecular and rewiring and neurogenesis and connectivity? And what effect is a subjective experience that breaks patterns, results in enlightenment? When we see these studies that indicate the, you know, kind of the mystic experience seems to be an indicator of the degree of response to some of these things. Anyway, long question. Sorry. I'm very no, interested, in what, you, very interested in what your thoughts are. Yeah. So I kind of just smile ruefully when people say we're going to get the big main effect without the psychedelic trip. And I smile <laughs> for two reasons. The first is it's, it's kind of pretty implausible because usually the, the data comes from a mouse. And, or a rat, and you think, you know, I don't think depression in a rat is probably, it's, it's, it's quite likely they don't have the same thinking processes as humans. It's very unlikely they've been abused by their parents, etc. So, So that's the first thing. It's the models that they use to, to kind of justify their investment are pretty, are pretty sort of trivial. But then, uh, then I think, well, why, why, why are they caring about this? And of course they're caring about it because of the controls, because of the, you know, these are scheduled drugs. And and these drugs are scheduled drugs because they cause trips I and mean, they're not harmful in any other way. And then it's the trips that change the way people think. And, you know, let's remember, you know, the reason the U.S. banned LSD and then all sucked in most of the other psychedelics behind LSD in, the, in 1967 was because of the Vietnam War. And, 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 and LSD was seen as part of the counterculture and the, and the, the anti-war movement, you know. And, you know, I don't know if it did much to support the anti-war movement, but it was definitely on the right side for the war, as you know. So med companies are thinking, well, it would be a lot easier to research these drugs. It's infinitely easier to research a drug that isn't controlled. And these drugs, they think, wouldn't be controlled. Now, my view is really, the, you know, as I've intimated, the opposite. I, I think that best, the maximal benefit you're going to get is a mixture of the psychedelic experience breaking down your resistances, disrupting your thinking processes, allowing you to see the reasons for your depression and not, in our studies, it's for often people do discover something that's been repressed. And also, very importantly, coming up with ways of reframing that, accepting it, or even looking for other solutions to the problems. So that those come out of the trip. But below that, there probably is a, la- a layer of some kind of neuroplasticity, which facilitates you developing a better mindset. Now, that plasticity may occur at non-psychedelic doses. So there might be some benefit for sub-psychedelic doses. I'd be surprised if there's any benefit from microdoses, but there could be. But it, to my mind, you know, the, 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 the solution to the problem of regulation is to change the regulations rather than try to change the molecules. <laughs>